as our burdens grow greater. He sends us more strength as our labors increase. To added afflictions, He offers more mercy. To multiply trials, He multiplies peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed and the day is half done, when we've reached the end of our earthly resources, our Father's forgiving is only begun. Our Father's forgiving is only begun. So
grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from a raging sea. And I am safe on this solid ground. The Lord is my salvation.
Hi everybody, uh, welcome again to our worship here at Oldfield Park Baptist Church. We're really delighted that you're sharing with us in this time again today. I guess probably yeah, a lot like me, you're perhaps feeling a bit weary this week. It's not an easy time of year, is it, under normal circumstances to be stuck in so much of the time, but particularly at the moment as we're in lockdown, uh, we've probably spent more time than we wish to, uh, confined to our own homes. And I guess perhaps you're feeling a bit weary and frustrated and tired of it all um, and probably all of us are feeling very similar at the moment. As we feel frustrated ourselves of course we are very mindful of those who are very poorly at the moment and those who are going through tough times and we're very mindful as well of all those who are serving us so diligently in our health service and um, they've been in my mind this week and even as I welcome you this morning. We're so grateful, aren't we, that so many people are giving of their, their very best efforts and their best energy on our behalf for the care uh, of our society and for us as individuals. So maybe you're feeling weary this morning, uh, but I hope that as we come to our God in worship, that our hearts and our minds and our spirits will be lifted as we turn our thoughts towards him and we remember who he is and who he has been and who he will continue to be for us. You know, this week I came across a prayer which I've adapted slightly, but largely left as it is. But it is a prayer that in which we lay before God our own sense of the challenges and the troubles and the difficulties sometimes of life. But we recognise that God is with us in those difficult seasons of our life. So we're going to begin with this prayer before we join together in singing our opening song of worship. So let's pray together, shall we? Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we praise you that you are with us, not simply when life is easy and carefree, comfortable and orderly, but also in the darkness, the emptiness, and those times when we feel lost and uncertain. Though you have never promised that life would be easy, without pain or problems, you have promised that you will never forsake those of us who trust in you. We praise you that no matter who we are, where we go, what we face, your almighty presence will never abandon us. We praise you for your gentle understanding of our doubts and our fears. We praise you most for Jesus Christ, your Son. In him you shared fully with us, in our joys and our pleasures, as well as our sorrows and our struggles. Because of Christ, we know that you're not a God who sits on the sidelines of life. Because of Christ, we are confident that you always know how we feel. And so, God the Father and God the Son, help us by your Spirit to praise you in every experience of life, even when we feel alone or afraid, rejected or overwhelmed, even when we feel lost or frustrated, confused or hurting. Help us to add our voice to all creation in bringing you praise. Amen. Well, we're going to praise our great God together, this God who has shared with us and knows what it's like to be human. And we're going to sing together uh, our opening song. Lord, we have seen the stars and moon. We have seen the sun awakening this new dawn, and we're rising up with all of creation to give you praise. Join with me as we sing. Lord, we have seen the rising sun awakening the early dawn, and we're rising up to give you praise. Lord, we have seen up with a cry and we're giving you our lives we will shine like stars in the universe holding out your truth in the darkest place we'll be living for your glory Jesus will be living for your glory 
see the rising sun awakening the early dawn and we're rising up to give you praise Lord we have seen the stars and moon see how they shine they shine for you and you're calling us to do the same so we rise up with the sun up with a cry and we're giving you our lives we will shine like stars in the universe holding out your truth in the darkest place we'll be living for your glory Jesus will be living for your share with you some words from Isaiah 40. I'm sure that some of these words are very familiar to many of you, uh, but they remind us of the might of our God and the power of our God and the uniqueness of our God. And as these words remind us of who God is, so they remind us that he's a God who can be relied upon and trusted in, a God who is dependable and who can strengthen us even in our weaknesses and our frailties. Isaiah writes this on God's behalf. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the skies. Who created all these things? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and his mighty strength, not one of them is missing. So why do you complain, my people? Why do you say, my way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. He is the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary, and he increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young people stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. This is the God we're worshipping today, a God who is sufficient to strengthen us, to help us, even in those times when we feel most weak and most needy. And we're going to continue to worship him. As we sing together our next song, O oh, worship the King, all glorious above, O oh, gratefully sing his wonderful love. O oh, worship the King, all oh, glorious above, O oh, gratefully sing his wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. The earth with its store of wonders untold, almighty your power has founded our old, established it fast by a changeless decree. Round it has cast like a mantle the sea. You alone are the matchless king, to you alone be all majesty. Your glories and wonders, what tongue can recite? You breathe in the air, you shine in the light. Your bountiful care, what tongue can 
can recite. It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plains, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Oh, measureless might, how boundless your love, while angels delight to worship above. Your mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. You alone are the matchless king, to you alone be all majesty. Your glories and wonders, what tongue can be signed? You breathe in the air. Shine in the light. You alone are the matchless king. To you alone be all majesty. Your glories and wonders, what tongue can decide? You breathe in the air. You shine in the light. You shine in the light. Well, in a second or two, David's going to bring us our Bible reading and Katie's going to lead us in our main prayer time. But I just wanted to let you know before they do that, that a little bit later in our service, towards the end of the service, after I've preached, we're going to be sharing in communion. So if you'd like to join us in that, and we would love you to do that, um, just wanted to give you some forewarning so that maybe you could get some bread and some form of liquid. It doesn't have to be red wine. And uh, you can share with us in that time towards the end of the service. We'd love to have you uh, joining with us and sharing that time. So let me hand over to David. He's going to bring us our reading this morning from Luke chapter 9. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, the Christ of God. Jesus strictly warned them, not to tell anyone this. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and he must be killed. And on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, if anyone would come on, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. We have read how even Jesus needed to pray to our Father in private to keep him focused in on that safe relationship and keep him serving in hope and joy, resisting Satan's lies. And Father, it is your pleasure for us too to pray to you this morning. Using the words we have sang and read already today, we want to remind ourselves together who do we say you are? Lord Jesus, 
God's Messiah, Maker, Defender, Redeemer. Splendid, loving, shield, ancient of days, tender, merciful, firm to the end. We thank you, Jesus, that you have made a way for us to be drawn near to a holy, glorious God without blemish. A God set apart from his creation. We thank you that in the gospel, through no effort of our own, we are made joint heirs with Jesus. Whatever we have faced this week and whatever uncertainties lie in the coming week or in the months to come as we wait for the vaccine, hoping that it might break the back of our current situation, we know that our life stories are set in a broader redemption story. We can look back and see how 2020 years ago Jesus did indeed come. Fulfilling prophecies, he suffered, he re was rejected, he was killed and he was raised to life. We thank you for that sacrifice laid down out of nothing but love for all creation but in particular a love for people. In a world riddled with sickness and death we praise you, Father, that at the cross you have crushed both and sin. And through the cross, many people will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Jesus, you stooped into humanity and lifted us to a place of undeserved righteousness. An eternity of peace and joy face to face with you. You are the matchless King. Father, you joined us together as a church, but through COVID, we are once again separated by the rules of another lockdown, but we remain together through Christ. And although we are scattered as we watch this, we continue to declare your might and sing of your grace. We thank you for the internet, for Louis and Mikey keeping us in a digital fellowship together. And we are so thankful for the way our phone calls and messages to each other, remind us again of the wonderfully prayerful network we are so blessed to be a part of in this church family. We continue to pray for friends and family as we offer their names and situations to you quietly now in prayer. Lord, as we finish this time of prayer, we want to ask you for wisdom and help to see the trials and the mundanities of the week ahead as opportunities to deny ourselves and follow you. Shift our gaze from worldly desires or spiralling fears to a zeal and a joy for you, trusting your promises. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, follow me. 
Today we're starting a new sermon series, and over the next few weeks, it's going to take us through four chapters of Luke's Gospel, chapters 9 through 12. And this morning we're going to kick-start this series by looking together at Luke chapter 9, verses 18 to 27, those verses that David read for us a few moments ago. As I said last Sunday, the Luke who wrote Luke's Gospel was a doctor by profession, And as a doctor, he would have been uh, well used to, accustomed to issuing prescriptions uh, for his patients. But Luke was also a disciple of Jesus Christ. And part of his passion, alongside his doctoring, was to share with others what he knew about Jesus. And in particular, what Jesus had to say and what Jesus had spoken. In particular, what Jesus had spoken about what it means to live as one of his disciples. Well, nowhere is that more true than in chapters 9 to 12 of of his gospel. In these chapters, Dr. Luke draws together some of the most important teaching from Jesus about what our lives should look like, how they should be shaped if we're really going to follow him and be true and devoted disciples of Jesus. And so really they, they serve as a kind of different kind of prescription, if you like, to the normal prescriptions that Luke would have issued as a doctor, a kind of spiritual prescription, a prescription about what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus. And so as we look at these chapters over the next few weeks, it's my hope and, and my prayer that we would receive these words, this teaching from Jesus passed on to us by Luke as a prescription for our own lives as disciples of Jesus, and that we might walk and live healthily as genuine and true followers of his. So like I say, we're going to begin this series this morning in Luke chapter 9, verses 18 to 27. This is where we find one of the most important prescriptions for living our lives as disciples of Jesus. And by the time we get to Luke chapter 9, Jesus has gathered around him uh, 12 disciples who journey everywhere with him. Twelve men. And yet this isn't the sum total of the disciples that Jesus had. Jesus had a larger group of disciples than just these twelve. Because if you go back to Luke chapter 6, you find out that Jesus chose this group of twelve men from a larger group of people that followed him, that were his disciples. What's more, if you look back at Luke chapter 8, you discover that there was a a little group of, of women who journeyed around with Jesus. And they were very often there in the company of Jesus, along with the twelve. These women were supporting Jesus out of their own means. So by the time we get to Luke chapter 9, there is a growing cohort of, of men and women in Jesus' entourage. Now we don't know, when we get to Luke 9, exactly how long this group of disciples had been with Jesus. But it must have been some time, because... Clearly, they'd begun to hear rumors in the crowds around them about who Jesus was. And they themselves had begun to formulate their own thoughts, their own opinions on the identity of Jesus. And we know that Jesus asks them a question, doesn't he, in Luke chapter 9. In fact, he asks them two questions. Once in verse 18, once in verse 20. In verse 18, he asks them the question, who do the crowds say I am? And immediately they respond. They don't take any time in in thinking about it. They immediately respond with what they've heard. Some say, Jesus, that you are John the Baptist. Others say that you're Elijah. Others say that you're another one of the Old Testament prophets of long ago. Now, of course, John, if you you read the Gospels, you would know that John is already dead by this stage. And certainly all of the Old Testament prophets have long gone. Not all died. Elijah didn't die. If you read his story in the the book of 2 Kings, you'll know that he was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. But the point is that all these people have gone from the earth. And so the crowds are passing around these kind of rumors that maybe Jesus is one of these 
uh, men who's died in the past come back to life again. Well, Jesus doesn't actually make any kind of response to that rumor, those rumors that were going around in the crowds. He just directs another question to the disciples and he says to them, okay, but who do you say I am? And again, immediately, there's a response. It's Peter who responds, but maybe he responds uh, on behalf of the whole crowd of disciples. And his response is this, you are the Christ of God. You might have a, a Bible translation that translates Peter's words as, you are the Messiah. Well, there's no discrepancy there. Christ and Messiah essentially mean the same thing. They mean anointed. Christ is simply uh, a Greek word for uh, that, uh, the, the word anointed. And Messiah is the Hebrew word for anointed. Peter is saying, you are the anointed, God's anointed one. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, more fully, what Peter was saying is, you are God's anointed ruler. You see, Peter was a Jew, and, and he lived among Jews, and the Jews had an expectation based on a promise from God in the Old Testament scriptures. In the Old Testament scriptures, God had said that one day, he'd said it several times, that one day he would send his Christ, his Messiah, his anointed one. He would send a, a new king, an heir to the throne of Israel's greatest ever king, King David. And this king, when he comes, God had promised, will have greater power and greater influence than the greatest king of Israel, King David. He would enjoy greater success and he would rule over a greater kingdom than King David had ever ruled. And every Jew was waiting expectantly for this anointed ruler from God to come. And they expected that when he came, that this would be a new season of favor and blessing from God on the whole of the Jewish nation, on every single one of them as Jewish people. So in calling Jesus Christ or Messiah, Peter was effectively saying, you are this one we've been waiting for. You are this mighty ruler from God who we've been expecting for generation after generation after generation. Now what led Peter to make this amazing claim about Jesus? If you, if you land in Luke chapter 9... It's not immediately clear what it was that led Peter to make that amazing declaration about Jesus. But if you look at the intervening chapters, you will discover why Peter made this declaration about Jesus. You see, in the intervening chapters, Peter had seen some amazing things. Some things that just boggled his mind, that blew his mind. Here are some of them. He'd seen Jesus heal the sick. There's a summary of that in Luke chapter 5, verse 15. By this stage, Peter had become a disciple of Jesus. He was with Jesus. And he saw, as Luke 5, verse 15 says, crowds of people came to hear Jesus and to be healed of their sicknesses. A few verses after that, we hear of a specific case of healing. Jesus heals a paralyzed man in Luke chapter 5, verse 24. When you get to Luke chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus heals a woman who had been afflicted by an incurable illness. And Peter had seen these things. Power, healing power go out from Jesus. But he'd also seen Jesus drive demons out of possessed people. There's a classic story about that in Luke chapter 8. Well, Peter was there. He saw this man who'd been in turmoil and anguish and mental um, oppression released by Jesus from the demons that dwelt within him. Peter had also heard those demons as they came out of that man declare Jesus' identity. What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God, the demons say. What's more, Peter had seen Jesus control the weather. There's the classic story in Luke chapter 8, 22 to 25, where Jesus is in the boat with his disciples and a storm um, surge comes up and, and Jesus stands up in the boat and he commands the wind and the waves to be quiet and they're still. And then he'd seen Jesus just before we get to this passage in Luke chapter 9, uh, verse 18. He'd seen Jesus back in the early part of Luke chapter 9, multiply food and feed thousands of people. Five loaves and two fish to feed at least uh, um, a, a thousand, 5,000 um, men, probably women and children as well. And you know, Peter had even seen Jesus raise the dead. Two stories 
there are in Luke's gospel before this uh, questioning of Jesus of his disciples in Luke 9. Luke 7 verses 11 to 17, Luke 8 54, Jesus raises the dead. So these were the things that Peter had seen and it didn't take a genius to figure out that these weren't the doings and the sayings and the actions of an ordinary man. Jesus was no ordinary man. He must be God's anointed ruler, was Peter's declaration and probably the declaration of all of the disciples with him. Well, you know, Peter's declaration of Jesus as the Christ or the Messiah is, is, is the very foundation of Christian discipleship. It's not possible to be a true disciple of Jesus unless we make this affirmation ourselves. Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are God's anointed ruler, King of kings and, and Lord of lords. Of course, none of us have access firsthand to the things that Jesus did and the things that Jesus said, but... We have sufficient eyewitness accounts in the Gospels, don't we, to be sure of the things that Jesus said and did. And, you know, Jesus would come to us just as he came to his disciples here in Luke chapter 9, verse 18 or verse 20. And he would say to us, who do you say I am? And every single one of us have to make a response to this question of Jesus. Um, My hope and my prayer is that the response that we make as we reflect on Jesus, what he did, what he said, is that we will say the very same kind of thing that Peter said. You are the Christ of God. You are God's anointed ruler. The first foundational step of Christian discipleship. Well, notice then what Peter, uh, that when Peter makes this declaration about Jesus, what Jesus does, he, he fully embraces it. He doesn't quibble about it. He doesn't question it. He doesn't demur about it. He willingly accepts it. Although he doesn't actually say anything, it's pretty clear from his words that Jesus was fully accepting of what Peter had said about him. Peter, you're right. I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. I am God's anointed ruler. Everything points to his full acceptance of what Peter said here. And you know, at that point, I can imagine that the disciples, Peter among them, They were waiting expectantly, waiting waiting with with bated breath to hear what Jesus would say next. Peter's just made this triumphant declaration. Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are God's anointed ruler. I imagine that he and all the disciples expected that the next words that left Jesus' mouth might be some kind of bold strategy for how he was going to set up his kingly rule on earth. Maybe Jesus would give some manifesto for how he was going to march on the capital city of Jerusalem, how he was going to overthrow that tyrant of a king, Herod, how he was going to push out the Roman Empire, and how he was going to set up his own throne in Jerusalem. Maybe the disciples thought, well, maybe Jesus now is going to muster us and send us out and tell us to draw others in so that we can all together collectively march on Jerusalem and enthrone Jesus. Well, you know, nothing Nothing at all could have prepared the disciples for what Jesus said next. Because he says three things. First, he says, don't tell anyone. Peter, you're right. I am the Christ. I am the Messiah, but don't tell anyone. And then he says, I, the Son of Man, must suffer many things. I must be rejected. I must be killed. I must suffer. And then he says to the disciples, if any any of you are going to stick with me as my disciples, you have to deny yourself. You have to take up your cross and you have to follow me. In short, if you're with me, you have to be prepared to die, to die to yourself, to travel this same kind of uh, cross-destined path that I'm about to walk. You know, to say that Jesus' words were Shocking would be an understatement. I guarantee that not one of his disciples expected to hear these words. Here's the plan, friends. I'm heading off to die. And if you want to follow me, come and die with me. Come and deny yourself. Come and take up your cross every day and follow me. Jesus had to correct their faulty notions of what it meant for him to be 
God's anointed ruler. And he had to correct their faulty notions of what it would mean for them to follow him as his disciples. You know, if the first rule of discipleship is to do what Peter did and to declare that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, God's anointed ruler, the second rule of discipleship is that the Jesus we follow is a Jesus who suffered and died. And that if we plan to follow him, we also must be prepared to be like him and to die a kind of death, to die to ourselves every single day. You know, one person said this, discipleship is more than getting to know what the teacher knows. It's getting to be what the teacher is. At another point, he said this, the making of a disciple means the creating of a duplicate. The making of a disciple means the creating of a duplicate. That's what Jesus says, doesn't he? I'm going to die, and you don't just need to know that if you're going to follow me you have to embrace the same thing that I'm about to embrace. You need to be prepared to die for me. Well, in the time that we have left this morning, we're going to home in on the things Jesus has to say, firstly about himself, and then about his followers, his disciples. In essence, Jesus says, I am going to be a cross-bearing Christ. And then in the second place, he talks about his followers as cross-bearing Christ. Disciples. So firstly, let's think about what Jesus says about himself. He describes himself as a cross-bearing Christ. So Jesus says three things must happen to him. And notice that word, not may happen, but must happen. Three things must happen to me, says Jesus. Firstly, I must be rejected. Secondly, I must be killed. And thirdly, I must be raised to life again. Let's think about those three things and consider why Jesus said that these three things must happen to him. Firstly, he must be rejected. The Son of Man must be rejected, he says, by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. But why? Why must Jesus be rejected by these people, these elders, these chief priests, these teachers of the law, all these highly religious people in uh, in, in, in uh, Judea. Why, why be rejected by them? Well, you know, the answer lies in something that was prophesied about Jesus just a few days after his birth. It wasn't many weeks ago, was it, that we were celebrating Christmas. And as part of our preaching series over Christmas, we, we thought about an encounter that Jesus had as a baby with an old man called Simeon in the temple. And Simeon says something about Jesus in Luke chapter 2, verses 34 to 35. He says this, He, Jesus, will be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. In other words, says Simeon, Jesus is going to be rejected in the future to reveal what's really in the hearts of people. Now, who were the people that rejected Jesus? Well, Jesus says, the people that reject me are going to be the religious people. And why would the religious people reject Jesus? The, the answer is because he criticized their way of life. What was it about their way of life that he criticized? Well, he criticized three things about the religious people in, um, in Israel. Firstly, Jesus criticized the fact that they had this kind of notion, this kind of idea... That we can be good enough for God on our own. And so what they did was they created this elaborate system of rules and regulations. Fine rules and regulations. Nitty gritty details. And they said if we can keep all of these tiny intricate details. Rules and regulations. Things that to many people would be a burden. Well, we can get to God on our own merit. We can get to God on our own merit. And you know, that led to huge pride in these people. We can elevate ourselves before God, so much so that he will accept us. And Jesus criticized that. Secondly, Jesus criticized the fact that they despised other people who didn't commit to all their rules. They weren't just proud of themselves, these people. They looked down on everybody else who didn't match up to their good standards. 
They weren't as good as them. But then thirdly, Jesus criticised the fact that these religious people were hypocrites. Whilst they claimed to do lots of good things and to follow lots of little nitty-gritty good rules and good regulations, their hearts were rotten. They neither loved God nor did they love their neighbour. The only people they really loved was themselves and everything they did was a big front to mask the fact that they loved themselves more than anybody else. And, you know, Jesus called them out on all of this so that they would know God detests your way of life. God detests your attitude. God detests your perspective. It doesn't meet with his approval. You won't get to God that way. Your pride, your looking down on other people, your hypocrisy is detestable to God. But, of course, they rejected that. And in rejecting what Jesus said, they rejected what God said and they rejected God And they plotted to take Jesus' life, and in the end, they got their own way. And you know, in doing so, their hearts were revealed. And not only were their hearts revealed, the rottenness of their whole way of life was revealed as well. The system that they claimed was so good that would get people to God, that would get them to God, actually ended in them becoming murderers, murderers of the Son of God. And you know, ultimately, what that reveals to all of us is that if any of us imagine we can get to God on our own merits without Christ, we're totally deluded. Such a way of life ultimately leads towards death, not life. And Jesus had to be rejected to expose the folly and the wickedness of this kind of self-serving way of life. So Jesus was rejected. Secondly, Jesus said, I must be killed. The Son of Man must be killed, says Jesus. But why? Why why must that happen to Jesus? Well, of course, Jesus, if you know the rest of Luke's gospel, Jesus gives the answer to that question towards the end of uh, Luke's gospel and towards the end of the other gospels. He says when he's with his disciples on the night of his arrest, the night before he's crucified, He's with them in an upper room. They're sharing a Passover meal together and he takes a cup of wine and he says, this blood is the new covenant in my blood. This wine is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Every Jew, including all of the disciples, they knew that God required blood sacrifices to be made for the forgiveness of sins. And for generations, it was animals that were sacrificed. The whole Passover celebration was the, uh, involved the sacrifice of an animal as a covering for sin, as it were, so that the people could come out of, of Egypt generations before and be rescued by God. But, you know, all the Jews knew that such animal sacrifices never provided a final solution to sin because those sacrifices had to be made over and over and over again. But when Jesus comes and he says, just before he dies, this is my blood which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins, for the forgiveness of many. He's saying that, you know, I am the one to which all those other sacrifices pointed. They were all made, those old sacrifices, in anticipation of my coming. And in my coming, those sacrifices end. Because I am going to offer once and for all a final sacrifice for sins, by my death, through my being killed. You know, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 10 verse 4 says this, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And then a few verses on, he says this, when Jesus Christ offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus had to be killed As a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins, your sin and my sin and the sin of everybody who has ever lived and ever will live. And once he'd done that, he sat down at the right hand of God because the act of sacrifice for sins was finished and done with. Jesus had accomplished and finished that work. You know, the big point in all of this is that Jesus had to be killed, as he said, Because that's the only way any of us can ever get to God. Only forgiven sinners can get to God. And such sinners can only come to God in one way. And that is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for them. Who was killed for them. 
So Jesus says, I must be rejected, I must be killed. And then thirdly, he says, I must be raised to life. The Son of Man must on the third day be raised to life. Why must that happen? Well, it must happen for three reasons. In the first place, it must happen to show that he really is God's anointed ruler. No other ruler, not even Israel's great King David, back in their glory days of old, could do what Jesus did. Jesus has power no other king has. He's conquered death, an enemy no other king can defeat. His resurrection shows him to be the king supreme, the king of kings, the king to trump all other kings, the lord to trump all other lords. Secondly, though, he must rise to show that he has defeated sin by his death and that he can now forgive every disciple who follows him. And then thirdly, he must rise to show that he has the power to give unending life to everybody who follows him, everybody who believes in him, everybody who trusts in him. Of course, ultimately, the death and the resurrection of Jesus reveals that he's not only a king for the Jews. You see, the disciples would have thought to themselves, well, Jesus, yeah, he, if, if he's Christ, if he's God's anointed ruler, he's a king for the Jews. But they misunderstood that. Jesus was going to be a king for sinners. And there are sinners of every nation and every tribe and every people and every language. So he's going to die and rise again for people of every nation and every tribe and every language. Jesus is going to be raised to life for all of those who are subject to death. Well, it isn't just Jews who are subject to death, is it? We're all subject to death. We're all heading towards the grave. But when Jesus rose from the dead, he was announcing, I have come to conquer death for all who will die. So that if you come to me, you will live forever. You'll receive the gift of eternal life. And in fact, the testimony of the Bible is that the day is coming when Jesus will return to earth and he will set up a kingdom greater than any kingdom ever known to man. It will be a kingdom of people from every nation, tribe, people and language. It will consist of a a population of people so large that you can't even number it, says Revelation 7 verse 9. So as Jesus said, he must be rejected to show us that we can't get to God on our own. He must be killed to provide forgiveness for the sins of all who become his disciples. He must be raised to life to show his true kingly power over sin and death. And to give eternal life to all who believe in him. All who become his disciples. He will give a share in eternal life in his father's kingdom. So Jesus is a cross-bearing Christ. And actually he's a cross-bearing Christ for our good. For your good. For my good. For our salvation. So that's the first thing we discover from Jesus' words in Luke chapter 9. But the second thing we discover is this as we've already touched on. Jesus' followers must be cross-bearing disciples. Whoever wants to be my disciple, says Jesus, must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. If, if you and I would enjoy all the benefits and blessings that come from Jesus, that are, that are offered to us through Jesus, we must be cross-bearing disciples. We must take up our cross every day. We must deny ourselves every day. And we must follow Jesus every day. You know, that's a huge challenge, isn't it, to all of us. When I hear Jesus' words, I think that's a huge challenge, a massive challenge. It's a huge challenge for all of us. You know, by nature, we're more inclined as human beings to be self-indulgent rather than self-denying. You know, you've only got to look, haven't you, at the, the advertising industry today, the modern advertising industry. You watch adverts on TV Or you check out the marketing material that drops out of a newspaper when it comes through your door. Or or you glance over the glossy full-page spreads, uh, advertising things in magazines. And as you look at them, you will know your own heart well enough to know how subtly and how uh, compellingly your heart is drawn towards self-indulgence. I wish I had that gadget. I wish I could eat that food. I wish I could go on that holiday. I wish I could have that possession. I wish I could live in that house. I wish I could have that car. You know, I'm not denigrating 
the advertising industry. I'm not saying that it's wrong to market things. All I'm saying is when we see these things, we know what it's like to have our hearts tugged. We are by nature self-indulgent people and not self-denying people. And so when Jesus' words land on us, they land with great challenge. You've got to deny yourself. Take up your cross every day and follow me if you want to be my disciple. You know, the preacher A.W. Tozer once described it like this. A person who becomes a disciple of Jesus is like a person who has learned to drive in a country where the traffic moves on the left side of the highway, but then suddenly finds themselves in another country where they're forced to drive on the right side. They must unlearn their old habit and learn a new one. And to make matters worse, they have to learn to do so in heavy traffic. Great description of what it means to follow Jesus, moving our lives in a different direction to the way in which we've been accustomed to moving, from self-indulgence to self-denial. You know, to be a disciple of Jesus means a radical change in the direction of travel of your life. Jesus describes it in two ways, doesn't he? Firstly, in verse 24, he describes it as losing our lives for him. And then secondly, he describes it as being unashamed of him and his words. Over the coming weeks, we're going to think about some of the practical ways in which we lose our lives for Jesus and some of the practical ways in which we live our lives unashamed of him and his words. We'll see some examples of that, some ways in which we live our lives this way. But, you know, as I reflected on these words of Jesus this week, four kind of phrases, four thoughts came to my mind about what it would look like for us to lose our lives for Jesus, to live self-denying, cross-bearing lives. Let me share them with you as we draw the sermon to a close. Here's the first thing that came to my mind. If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, your pride must be relinquished. My pride must be relinquished. You know, pride was one of those insidious evils that resided in the heart of those religious people who rejected Jesus when he was on earth. Pride is that attitude in our hearts whereby we think to ourselves, you know what, I'm a pretty good person actually. I'm a pretty righteous person. Certainly I'm better than this person or that person or the other person. And if there's any way of scoring credit with God, well, I'm sure I've scored enough brownie points with God to get to God on my own strength, in my own merit. You know, Jesus says that has to go. That attitude has to go out of the window. He actually told a classic parable one time about how God responds to that attitude as opposed to a humble attitude. You know the story, I'm sure, the parable, Luke chapter 18. Let me remind you of it. Jesus says, Two men went up to the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, a religious man of of high regard, and the other, a tax collector. The Pharisee, he stood by himself and he prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I'm not a robber. I'm not an evildoer. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector... He stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I tell you, said Jesus, that this man, this tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. To be a disciple of Jesus, we must relinquish our pride. We must be willing every day to come before God and say, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I'm not as good as I sometimes think I am. I'm certainly not as good as other people think I am. I'm a sinner and I'm in need of your forgiveness. Please forgive me. Please look upon me with grace, with mercy. You know, if you can't live that kind of life, then God is going to humble you. He's going to bring you down. He's going to put you on your knees and shame you one day. Pride has to go. That's part of our self-denial in following 
Jesus. You have to kill pride. Pride must be relinquished. Then secondly, passions must be reevaluated. The passions of your life must be reevaluated. You know, the passions and desires in your heart and mine are not all good. The world these days would say to you, and I bet you've heard this saying, I've certainly heard it plenty of times, follow your heart. Follow your heart. Go where your heart leads. What would Jesus say to that? He would say, don't believe a word of it. That's a bad idea. Don't simply go through life following your heart. Don't simply go through life pursuing your passions because many of them are corrupted by your sinful nature. You know, Galatians chapter 5 lists some of the passions of the human heart which are totally disordered by our sinful nature. Among them are these. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, loving other things instead of God, hatred, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, living your life to, 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 to get what you can for yourself, for yourself alone, selfish ambition, drunkenness. These are some of the disordered but natural passions that you and I will find ourselves experiencing coming out of our heart. We will sometimes desire these things. Well, listen to what Galatians 5 verse 24 says. It says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. That matches perfectly, doesn't it, what Jesus says about what it means to follow him. Take up your cross every day. Paul says in Galatians 5.24, crucify your sinful nature. Don't listen to your heart. Reevaluate your passions in the light of what God's word says, in the light of the truth that Jesus teaches. Don't simply go along with whatever you feel like doing. Reevaluate your life. Reevaluate your passions. This is part of what it means to deny yourself, take up your cross every day, and follow Jesus. So pride must be relinquished. Passions must be reevaluated. Thirdly, priorities must be reordered. You know, in the coming weeks, we'll get towards the end of Luke chapter 9. And when we get to the end of Luke chapter 9, we'll find three mini accounts of different people who Jesus had encounters with, some of whom offered to follow him, some of whom he called to follow him. Well, one of them considers it this following of Jesus. But then he says to Jesus this. He says, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Sounds like a reasonable request, doesn't it? But what does Jesus say? Jesus says this. No one who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. That sounds a very harsh thing to say, doesn't it? Jesus, I only want to go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus says, don't look back if you're going to follow me. Keep your eyes fixed on me and order your priorities around me. Now, Jesus must have seen something in that person. He must have known that person is so wedded to their family. If they go back there, they'll be so distracted by the things at home, so distracted by other things in their life that they'll never follow me. Their whole priority system is disordered. You know, if you want to follow Jesus... Everything else has to take second place. Jesus has to be number one. He has to be your first priority. He has to have the chief call on how you live your life and what you do with your life. So your pride must be relinquished. Your passions must be reevaluated. Your priorities must be reordered. And then the final thought that God brought to my mind as I thought about what it would look like to take up our cross and follow Jesus is this. Partnerships must be reviewed. The other evening, we were sitting together as a family and we were um, reading the Bible together, spending some time in prayer, and we came to a little passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And here's what it says in verse 14. It says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? But, you know, that's simply a way of saying don't get hooked up in an intimate relationship in any way 
If you want to be a disciple of Jesus with somebody who is not a disciple of Jesus. Because in all likelihood, they will entice you away from Jesus. They will draw you away from Jesus. They're not going to help you live as a disciple of Jesus. They're going to have a detrimental effect on you. You know, I have seen over the years people who've hooked up with unbelievers in intimate relationships and they have struggled to carry on walking as a disciple of Jesus. In fact, some of them have quit following Jesus altogether because it was too difficult with no encouragement, no support, no help. So Jesus says, look, review your partnerships. Don't hook yourself up in intimate relationships with people who aren't disciples of mine. You know, if we're going to be disciples of Jesus, taking up our cross daily, denying ourselves daily, following Jesus daily, we need to be losing our lives for him. We need to be unashamed of him and his words. And here are some of the ways we must work towards doing that. Our pride must be relinquished. Our passions must be re-evaluated. Our priorities must be reordered. And our partnerships must be reviewed. And you know, Jesus makes a great promise in verse 24. He says, you know, whoever loses their life for me will save it. Your life will be saved for all of eternity if you will lose your life for Jesus. What a wonderful promise that is. But at the same time, Jesus gives a stark warning. Whoever wants to save their life, whoever wants to keep their life in their own hands, whoever wants to live their life their own way and live solely for what this life has to offer, Well, they're going to lose their life. You're going to lose your life if you won't have Jesus. You know, my prayer this morning and as we go through these coming weeks and look at some of the other aspects of discipleship is that all of us will decide as the Spirit of God works in our hearts. Jesus is the Christ. And for that very reason, I am going to lay down my life, take up my cross every day. And follow him. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord Jesus, we want to thank you that you journeyed the way of the cross. Lord, we know that what you did in going to the cross has purchased salvation for us. Has brought about the possibility and the potential for the forgiveness of our sins if we will come to you. That has won for us the gift of eternal life if we will come to you. Lord Jesus, thank you that you went the way of the cross. That you didn't hang back. That you didn't avoid it. But you embraced it for our good, for our salvation. And Lord Jesus, having seen the good things that you've won for us through your cross-bearing life. We pray that you would help us to be cross-bearing disciples. Laying our lives down for you, taking up our cross every day and following you, relinquishing our pride, re-evaluating our passions, reordering our priorities, reviewing our partnerships and setting you before us as our Lord, as our Master, as our Christ. Because we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. In a few moments we're going to share together in communion going to share bread and wine together. But before we do that, let's sing together. I will glory in my Redeemer.
we've been reminded this morning, haven't we, of that moment when Jesus let his disciples know for the very first time what his destiny was going to be. He was heading to Jerusalem. He was heading to the cross. He was heading to lay his life down. And you know, that was a difficult thing for the disciples to hear. Peter, for one, uh, rebuked Jesus for saying that. He questioned what Jesus was talking about. And yet Jesus rebuked Peter back and said, no, this is the plan. This is the will of my Father in heaven. This is the way that I'm going to glorify my Father. And this is the way in which I'm going to provide salvation for all those who will come to me. By my death, by my resurrection on the third day, I'm going to open the gates to heaven. Open the possibility of a relationship with God for all people. And we're here to celebrate that as we come around the communion table, as we share in bread and not necessarily in wine, whatever you have there available to you to drink. You know, the cross of Jesus was an expression of God's great love for us. And one of our songs reminds us of this great love of God revealed to us through Jesus and his cross. From heaven you came, helpless babe. Entered our world, your glory veiled. Not to be served, but to serve. And to give your life that we might live. Come see his hands and his feet. The scars that speak of sacrifice. Hands that flung stars into space to cruel nails surrendered. And you know, there's that chorus in that song as well that reminds us of two things. Firstly, our response to such a great gift from God is to worship him. To give him our praise. To believe in his son, the Lord Jesus. But our response is also to say, Jesus, Father, Here I am. I want to live my life in service for you. This is our God, the servant king. He calls us now to follow him, to live our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. Now as we come around the communion table, as we eat bread, as we drink together, we remember that these elements are symbols of the body and the blood Of Jesus Christ given for us. And as we eat and drink, we remember that He gave Himself for us, and we offer our lives back to Him today in obedience and in service. Before we eat and drink, let's hear God's Word. First, some words from Colossians chapter 1, and then some words from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in His Son, and through His Son to reconcile to Himself. All things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now God has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, not moving Established and firm, not moving from the hope held out in the gospel. And in those words from 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, you do so in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, I love the fact that here, as we eat bread and we drink wine or drink whatever liquid we have, we're not just looking back to an event in history where Christ gave himself for us, but we're looking forward as well to the time when Jesus will come again and he will take home to be with him all those who trust in him, all those who believe in him, all who have been his cross-bearing disciples and we will share in a feast in heaven with him for all eternity. Well, if you're there um, joining me this morning, let's take bread. And as we take bread, let's remember that this is representative of the body of Jesus broken for us.
And then let's also take what, what it is we have to hand to drink. And as we drink, let's remember with thankfulness and with joy the gift of Jesus shedding his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's drink together. Let's pray, shall we? Loving God, our Heavenly Father, we worship you for all that you have done for us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour and our Lord, for revealing through Christ your loving heart to us. Thank you for his life and ministry on earth that he carried out with grace and compassion. Thank you for his teaching about your kingdom that he delivered with truth and power. Thank you for his death for us in our place to bring us forgiveness and deliverance from sin. Thank you for his resurrection on the third day to bring us the joy and the hope of eternal life. Jesus, it is because of you and you alone that we can come to God as our Father. That we can live free of condemnation and expectant of a bright future in your holy presence. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us so that we might live every day for your praise. That we might live every day in obedience to your commands. That we might live every day in full submission to your plans for our lives. We give you all our worship, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to sing our closing song together. A song that reminds us of Calvary but reminds us of all that Jesus accomplished for us there. Let's sing together. I cast my mind to Calvary. I cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus bled and died for me I sing his word Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah. Trample down.